asked a guy who knows far more about this than me to speak, and he said, no, I'd really rather prefer if you did it. And, and uh, so I've had to put a, a sort of personal slant in this. And there's two, two parts about the sustainable future. The first is, this is the stuff that, in effect, has driven the legislation that's come about. And in case anybody hasn't noticed, we don't live in a, in a communist country where we're told what to do a lot of the time. We're given lots of hints, lots of guidance, lots of incentives and some encouragement as well. We're never told specifically, you must do this. So there's a framework about what you ought to be doing to try and achieve such and such a result. But there's always options. So the second reason this roadmap is important is, as you're following these options, if you follow the reason behind the options, you'll, you'll end up pleasing the people that are making the rules, and they probably won't make more rules. If you don't quite follow and achieve what they're trying to achieve, they'll make more rules and make life even tougher for you. So following the roadmap that, that led to the rules in the first place is, is probably a good idea. So sustainable future, blimey, what does that mean? Uh, you know, five years ago, uh, we started thinking about this and doing a lot of research and reading government papers and, and uh, things like uh, sustainable uh, heat or sustainable energy uh, without hot air by David Mackay. There's lots and lots of stuff out there, and that's a real challenge. Every week, some new report or piece of evidence comes out that we should be um, putting into our, our thinking. So this presentation is at tinyurl.com forward slash sust future. And really, the first thing to do is decide where you want to get to, decide what the goal is, and work your way back in steps from that. It's a very uh, commonly used technique in, in scenario planning and strategy forming. But decide where you want to go. I mean, it sounds obvious. You know, I'm, I'm going to uh, the Maldives for my holiday. I've decided where I want to go. I now need to work out how to get there. I don't decide I'm going to go to the airport and just randomly get on a flight and end up somewhere fairly random. I might have a nice time, but it makes more sense if you pick the goal first. It's obvious to say that it's going to be a long and winding road, not least of all because it's a challenging thing to try and do to be sustainable, but because the rules will keep changing. There will be tweaks. There will be other people doing things round about. So trying to get this uh, goal, and maybe the goal needs to shift a little bit, is, is a bit of a challenge. So breaking that sustainability down into some more uh, bite-sized chunks, three, three different bits of it. And basically what I'm saying is, if you keep this in mind while you're doing whatever it is your business does, there's a fair chance you'll be thinking sustainably and there's a fair chance that will be complementary to the rules that are being uh, encouraged. So the environmental aspects. There's also the financial aspects and there's the social aspects. Quite often we see two out of three of these emerging where we do something that's that's really good for the environment and really good socially, but financially it's a disaster and needs a huge amount of support. Equally so, there might be something that's good environmentally and, and financially, but it doesn't actually really stack up from a social perspective in terms of jobs or, or any other, other ways you might define that. My definition is we're trying to use clean local resources to reduce costs while engaging society. That's my thought. And if we try and stick on that, I think we'll end up somewhere that is uh, fitting with what the, the governments are, are trying to get us to do. There's a very obvious thing about sustainability, and it's to use less energy. And really, there's nothing more to say in that. Use less. So I've got no slide, no, no detail of that slide. It's not what today's about, but in principle, start with trying to use less. Use old fuel. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's energy from waste. It's a fantastic area where we have huge amounts of opportunity to divert energy and let's not think of it as waste, it's not waste. The trash we put out, in my case on a Monday night, isn't, isn't waste, it's energy. If we can recycle that in the first instance, but use what can be used as a fuel, we'll, we'll do very well. So things like uh, anaerobic digestion, creating methane from, from compost, basically. It's a big, big business, there's lots of guys doing really well at it, and it's a fantastic thing to do, far better than dumping it in landfill, and the gas escapes by itself and is lost for all, all valuable purposes. There's also other forms of, of energy from waste where, where aspects that maybe are better dealt with by incineration instead of just burning it. And I remember it used to be the treat as a kid going to, going to, the, going to the dump, as we called it, and just throwing, throwing uh, the larger items in. And they were just burned. They were burned purely to get rid of them. There was absolutely no energy consequence from that. Now we're seeing energy from waste. It's an absolutely fantastic thing to do. So from a sustainability point of view, thinking about everything as a resource is, is a great idea. However, and this is, this is where I put on my miserable voice, you have to dig into the numbers a little bit. And taking very clearly, I'm saying these are good things to do. What I'm saying is just work out 
how big an impact they're going to have on our total energy bill. So looking into the, uh, the total heating bill, and this is a graph that's absolutely blatantly obvious to anybody, the quantity of energy, heat energy we're using for space heating is, is the biggest portion of anything. So if we're thinking about our fuels, if we can get them into uh, a form that makes them easy for heat, we're probably going to do quite well. Looking at the food waste thing, and we're all throwing away food waste all the time. We're all trying to do less of it, but we keep buying too much and putting too much in our plates and then throwing it in the bin. Let's look at some of the numbers. And the data came from a magazine that crossed my desk uh, last week called Waste Lines. It wasn't from Waste Watchers. That's a slightly different publication. <laughs> and some data from the future of heating that DEC produced. So fairly up-to-date stuff. So this is examples from a new plant that was in this magazine. It's an absolutely brilliant thing. Again, I want to really emphasize we should be doing this. But what we're talking about was 45,000 tonnes per annum of food waste, and they were going to, to generate 2.4 megawatts of electricity and 3 megawatts of thermal heat from this food waste. Now, extrapolating that up to a UK level, what, what is the extent that we could achieve with this? Well, there's 7 million tonnes per annum of food waste in the UK, so that would be 155 of these, these plants. That's really good if you're in that line of industry, and, and again, I think it's a really good thing to do and that would give us 370 megawatts of electricity capacity and 480 megawatts thermal capacity from that plant. Let's put that in context. That's 0.6 of the UK's electrical and heating and 0.34 of the UK's heating capacity. So something that we should do, something that's going to be good business for guys doing it, it isn't enough. Perhaps also people that are still going to have to burn gas, maybe instead of doing anaerobic digestion and making gas and then burning gas in a gas engine and getting some electricity and some heat. Maybe if we can sort out the rules with the relation to the injection of that biomethane into the network for people that will have to burn gas, there will always be people that need to burn gas. That might be a, a better way of looking at it. So there's a, a quick, quick take on uh, use old fuel. Use it wisely is a subheading. What about using new fuel better? Combined heat and power. It's a, it's a massive segment of industry, and it can get us up from uh, efficiencies around about 35 or 40 percent in the, in the making of electricity up to 90 percent, because we're using the byproduct from this process, the heat, usefully. So lots more being said later on about uh, combined heat and power, and some of the numbers here. My point is, and the sustainability point is, when you're doing that technique, think about the uh, Think about the sustainability Venn diagram, the three parts of environmental, financial and social. If you are very much in line with what the government want to achieve, which is a net overall reduction in fossil fuels and fossil fuel imports, then that business stream will carry on for quite a long time. If it's a little bit better than what we're doing at the moment, but maybe not good enough when you look at the headline stuff that's coming out of the European Union, and other speakers will say more on that later, then there's a chance it's a bit of a bit of a trend that, that isn't going to stick. But it's definitely a, definitely a good thing to do. We're, we're getting 50% heat and 30% electricity, whereas previously we might just be making electricity and throwing away the heat. And on a larger scale, that's kind of what it looks like. We're, we're harnessing the waste heat. But it comes back to that environmental thing. I have a, an observation of it as well, and in the context of putting in this specialised equipment, this is the typical heat profile for a building. It's higher in winter and lower in summer. If you put in a device that likes running flat out across a certain level, and that level is picked as the summer demand, then what happens the rest of the year? What happens to the yellow bit and the red bit? You've got to make that from somewhere else. If you've spent your investment doing something that only really gives you a quantity of heat that is, let's face it, a fairly small portion. I've not done the maths on this, but I'd guess the blue bit's about roughly the same size as the yellow and red bit added together. What does that mean in practice? That means that that building is still getting more than half its heat from doing what it used to do, which is burning gas. There's a downside as well. If they've got a centralised plant and they're pushing that heat around networks of pipes, they're spending electricity to move the water, and they're losing heat from the pipes as well. So it's actually a really bad way to burn gas is to burn it centrally and send it round pipes. That isn't energy efficiency. That's just doing it differently and a bit fancier. So we'll hear from uh, Yoni Var at Draman later on, but in case he doesn't say it, the obvious thing is at Draman, that's the amount that they get of good heat 
and only the red bit is the top up. The heat pump is doing the yellow bit and the blue bit. So they only burn gas in the very, very cold days. So use a short carbon chain fuel, biomass basically. There does seem to be lots of it. We can certainly use it for electricity, we can use it for heat, and we can use it for electricity and heat. What I would say, back to the Venn diagram, think about the sustainability aspect of it. Think about actually where is this fuel coming from and how much of it is there? And is this the best thing I could do with the fuel? I would hazard a bet that lots of people are going to be wanting this fuel and the price is going to go up and up and up. So I definitely would get into the biomass business, but I would get into the biomass business on the selling end of the, of the supply chain. Heat recovery, we'll hear more about it later. And there are certain cases where there's, let's call it high-grade heat that can be harnessed and we just need to get it from A to B and we can use it. So getting the heat back from steel processes and glass processes. The big question is, how many of these sort of examples are there and where are they? They tend to be a little bit remote, not quite as remote as Ben Nevis, but certainly it's not exactly on our doorstep anymore. We see reasonable quantities of facilities that have plumes of steam coming off the top of them. I've looked at this quite carefully and I would caution on one particular aspect of it. If you want to take the heat out of that condensed, of that plume by condensing it, you're then left with a liquid and it's far harder to get rid of a liquid than something you can throw up the chimney with the steam in it and it disperses from an environmental perspective. So just because there's a plume coming off it and just because it's warm doesn't mean it can necessarily be harnessed. What about new high-grade heat? Definitely things to think about in terms of deep geothermal. If you're in the right place and you've got enough money to drill the hole and you're certain you're going to get what you want, good thing to do. Concentrated solar, even in Scotland, there's certainly some opportunities for concentrated solar, whether it's for making electricity or, or for heat. Do think about how these projects come together. There's always a money man, and money men like certainty. They like things that are easy to do, that are repeatable without the risks. So if you go to them and say, I'm thinking of drilling a hole in the ground here, it's going to be £2 million, I'm pretty confident I'm going to find what I want, but I'm not 100% certain, he's not going to like that. So all projects need a money man behind them. The same way as the, the, solar, the solar aspects, if they're repeatable and bankable, great, the money guys will follow that. You see this quite clearly in biomass, that's the big challenge in biomass at the moment, is it's getting harder and harder to finance biomass projects, because who knows what the price of fuel is going to be longer than five years. So heat recovery, and this is the bit that today's about, about finding something that's warm, let's put an international standard of scale on it, warmer than a Norwegian fjord or colder. So our factories and other industrial processes are, are producing heat. Data centres are another good example. They're producing heat at 30 degrees. It's warmer than the Norwegian fjord. So it's definitely possible to do it. And if you've got a need for heat, then great, you're in business. You can move it from 30 degrees up the way. This is a plant that we did for a company called Emerson Climate Technologies. They have a compressor factory in, in Belgium. And this plant takes the waste heat from their testing processes of the compressors and moves it into the manufacturing process. So it's a bit of joined up thinking showing that you can, within your own building, you don't have to burn electricity to do cooling and then burn gas to do heating. Maybe if we join it up. It's the same, same techniques we did for a chocolate factory uh, in, in Halifax where the heat from the cooling process is used for part of the chocolate manufacture. So this particular one recovers 10 degree heat and boosts it up to 65 degrees. It's better than a fjord. Be careful though, heat recovery, you, you need this coincidence. You can't have heat recovery from Perth and deliver it to, to uh, Glasgow, for example. The distances are too far. You have to do it on a fairly short basis. Another example of a short basis we did was Great Ormond Street Hospital. It has cooling because it's a hospital and it has heating because it's a hospital. So instead of burning gas for the heating, they recover heat from the, from the cooling process and get some heating. So that's our, our sustainable point of view. We're, we're definitely trying to focus in the middle of the sustainability bit. And to, to sum up, there's lots and lots of sources of heat and they're all absolutely the right thing to do in the right place. However, if you think about the grade of heat that you've got, if you have a factory that needs steam, there's a fair chance you're going to have to burn something. So there's an obvious one. If you have a university that needs to heat lecture theatres like this to 21 degrees and labs and so on, and maybe some hot water, maybe you don't need to burn something. 21 degrees is not very far above zero degrees. An airport, it doesn't need steam, it just needs warmth at round about 21 degrees. Probably have to, to do it by, by using heat at 60 or 70, but again, we don't need to burn something at 1300 degrees to get to 60 or, or 21 degrees. 
and the new Sutherland General Hospital that's being built. Again, it's a hospital. It needs lots of hot water and heating. And these things are round about 60 degrees, 70 degrees, down to about 21 degrees. It's not 1,300 degrees. You don't need to burn something for it. And thinking about the source and taking all these things about sustainability and the easiness and the practicality, we're blessed in this country with a really crap climate. We don't get a very good summer. It lasts about three weeks. We don't get a very good winter. We don't get much skiing. It lasts about three weeks. And we have 46 weeks of sprotum in between time. That means that we can do what you can't do in central Germany, which is take heat from the river. Because in central Germany, in winter, the river is a fair chance it will be too close to zero impinging on that latent heat that was mentioned earlier. Our rivers don't go terribly cold. The measurements that we did, even on the Kelvin, which is a shallow, fast-flowing river, didn't drop below four degrees in most of the winter. And what we're not saying is you need a technique that you can use 100% of the time. We're saying do it 95% of the time and rely on the, the, more, the more amenable forms of fuel, like uh, burning gas, on a short basis, but do the bulk of the heat the good way and just leave the rest the other way. So that's the sustainability point of view that kind of underpins what the rest of today is about. And I'll hand you over to the next speaker now. Thank you.